is in um, Spring Branch, right over a little town called Memorial. Yeah. And Memorial is full of lead paint. Full of it. Oh, yeah. Yes. I can imagine. Yeah. All the houses. Basically, if you own a house that was built before the 70s, no, before the 80s, you're going to have a lead paint issue. Okay. So before the 80s. Before the 80s, I'm pretty sure. Okay, cool. I might have to Google that. But okay, so, so off the top of my head. afterwards is when they stopped that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, afterwards okay. is when they started realizing weird stuff was happening. It's okay. always like weird stuff starts happening. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. It's always, there's a pattern in all these. <laughs> yes. It's always, it's always like, why are these kids, why can none of these kids learn how to read? You know, yeah. and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 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 So a lot of people, because lead paint or lead pipes are old and lead paint is old, a lot of people think that lead is a, like an old problem yeah it's not a real problem anymore but and that's usually because you don't live in michigan or you don't live in a you know a town that has a lot of lead paint a lot of americans don't realize that lead is still a very very serious problem yeah um especially for apartment dwellers yeah just because it's old doesn't mean it's gone yeah just because they stopped using it doesn't mean it's not still there yeah because like it's I mean, they didn't just get rid of it all. Yeah. You know they're not going to do that. <laughs> this isn't like asbestos where they're still using it. Yeah, yeah. In the case of lead, they are, they really are not using it anymore. Yeah, but, but it's just yeah. stick, stuck around. Yeah, it's stuck in those old homes. Old and homes and old pipes. Like old pipes, yep. So let's get started with uh, the history of lead. Okay, cool. And guess who it starts with? <clears throat> the The Romans and the the greek or I know. something <laughs> yeah they seem to be the pioneers of everything yeah which is honestly really cool kudos to them <laughs> um there is some earlier lead lead or romans i called them i almost called them leads romans <laughs> are the first ones to use lead pipes okay but uh it was also used for decorative objects so we see statues in turkey uh from six uh six thousand bce uh pharaohs used lead in pottery not personally, like the pharaohs had lead that had, yeah. I mean, they weren't like making lead, they weren't, they were pharaohs. Okay, yeah, yeah. But they had, <laughs> yeah, I feel like I should rephrase. Egyptian pharaohs had pottery made out of lead. Okay, okay. They were not throwing, it was not like ghosts where they're yeah. like making pottery together. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that was between 3000 and 4000 BCE. It was also used in construction. Uh, Babylonians and Assyrians used lead to fasten bolts and construct buildings, which is crazy. Oh, wow. And the Chinese used lead to make coins. And they found uh, 4,000 BCE in China uh, coins made out of lead. Wow. But as I mentioned, it's the Romans, of course, who really innovate lead. They're the first ones who realize that lead is excellent for making water pipes and lining bathtubs. Here we go. (laughs) <laughs> I know. And this starts the story, uh, the lead poisoning. Um, the Latin word for uh, lead, or for, excuse me, the Latin word for the guy who made the lead pipes was plum bum. Plum bum. And plum like bum that. sounds like kind of what? Like the modern word for plumbing. Yeah, that's right. So we have another <laughs> root word here. Yep, yep. Um, also, if do you know what lead is on the periodic table? You took AP Chem. You should know uh, this. Is it (laughs) L-E? She failed AP Chem, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a long time. (laughs) Uh, To be fair, she didn't take the test, so she didn't have to actually study. I took the class, but, you know, we made Um, it through somehow. (laughs) The periodic table symbol for lead is PB. Oh. Because the Romans were calling it plumbum. Okay, okay, okay. okay, Yeah. I'm probably saying plumbum wrong. That reminds me of uh, the the Sims, (laughs) because their little, like, diamond on the head is called a plumbob. Is it really? <laughs> it's called a plumb bob. Another Roman. Yeah. <laughs> Romans also invented the Sims. There you go. Nice, nice. So here we go. We, and the Romans come into more trouble with lead. They realize that the best way to preserve wine is to line the wine jars with lead. That sounds like a horrible idea. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> so no. when boiling the crushed grapes, the oh. Roman vinters, which is a winemaker, used lead pops or lead-lined copper kettles for the boiling process. Oh. And the idea was it threw off, it changed the flavor, and lead gave the wine sweet overtones. So lead wine. Dun, dun, <laughs> That's what dun. they were drinking. Sweet overtones from lead? That sounds horrible. They, I don't think it was worth the, the flavor. <laughs> <laughs> the reason we know this is because they actually found Roman recipe, like cookbooks, oh. for how to make wine. And it, it suggested sugar of lead. Um, 
and which yeah i know which sugar is a of lead. sugar of lead they also would powder lead into what was called lead acetate because it added a sweet taste you also by the way find this lead acetate in medieval cookbooks as well wow yes do not try this at home <laughs> yes so they're putting it in their plumbing they're making their wine with it they were putting it in their dishes to eat off of because it is such a yeah. malleable metal as we heard in the introduction using it for coins and using it for cosmetics that is like the weirdest group of things like oh we're using it in our, in our pipes but we're also putting it in our wine like <laughs> that doesn't sound good i know of course right they don't know yeah, but they yeah. start to realize that people get these weird groups of illnesses yeah some strange illnesses ha start happening in the roman empire for example um upper class men start to become sterile okay and of course the people who are drinking the fancy sweet wine yeah. are upper class they men. all got money they all got money so, so a famous example of that is julius caesar oh he was a great famous womanizer yeah. He's most well known. I mean, I'm going to get hate for this, but I think we should give credit where credit's due. Caesar's most well known as Cleopatra Baby Daddy. Yes. Yeah, I he agree. wrote a couple books. He did write a couple famous books. Whatever. Right? But <laughs> we're going to say he's Cleopatra Baby Daddy, right? Yep. Yes. Yes, he is. And that was his only child. Wow. Yeah. So he couldn't have any more. After no, he that. was known. He was quite old. But Cleopatra was in her 20s. He was in his 50s. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Um, and he had other wives, had a lot of girlfriends. I guess you know, Romans probably weren't calling them girlfriends, but he mm. had a lot of ladies and mm. he only fathered one child. Wow. Which um, it was also noted that he enjoyed drinking wine. The wine. Okay. Um, Caesar Augustus, you know who Caesar Augustus was? I think so. Maybe, kind of. He Maybe was the first of. emperor of Rome. Okay. He was also Caesar, Julius Caesar's nephew. Oh, okay. okay yeah. Okay. Original named Octavian, but he changed it to Caesar Augustus to make himself a badass. Nice. <laughs> um, they say he was sterile. He never actually had any children. Wow. This yeah. is crazy. Um, there's also a form of uh, a, a disease that the Romans start getting called Saturnine gout. And we know now that Saturnine gout is caused by lead intoxication. Okay. So, so sa they called it Saturnine gout because Saturn was um, a, <laughs> it's kind of weird. He, he was a god and he was known for being kind of gloomy and sluggish. And he also ate his own children, which I don't know why they went with that one. But the Romans were weird. But they notice a similarity that people who got this gout would start to get depressed and sluggish. Okay. So they called it the Saturnine gout because they were acting like the god. Not that they ate their own children, but yeah, yeah. Other they had shared other traits yeah, other than the cannibalism. It's mainly the other stuff, not the not the children eating. Um. <laughs> yeah. So the the uh, description the Romans were using for Saturnine gout was elevated uh, blood acid in the uh, excuse me elevated blood levels in the urine okay and um we know now that's caused by lead that's so interesting yeah so the romans knew something was getting them sick yeah uh, they just they never always know they yeah, always know but... they knew there was something in their environment that was making them sick but they never quite made that connection yeah of course, we forget all about that in the Middle Ages, right? We forget how to make pipes. We forget how to make wine and lead. So not all, it wasn't all bad, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the good thing they did. Yeah. Uh, it could have been a lot worse, probably. But that doesn't mean they stopped using lead. Yeah, I'm sure there was just probably like a long period that it was just not used. In the Middle Ages, lead was used by alchemists because they were, you know what? You read Harry Potter, right? Yes. Nicholas Flamel was an alchemist. Okay. Yeah, Why yeah. was he famous? I don't remember why it's been... Okay. Well, he remember, made the again. Sorcerer's Stone. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But alchemists in general were famous because um, they would turn base metals into gold. Ooh, so okay. in the Middle Ages, lead was a common component for alchemy because they believed that it, they could turn it into gold. Uh, it didn't work, by the way. You can't do that. Of course it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> you That'd can't be turn, magical. <laughs> you can't turn lead into gold. Yeah. Um, when the printing press was finally made, Ooh, which nice, is in the Renaissance, nice. they're using lead in the printing press. Okay. But again, they're not really like eating it, right? Yeah, yeah. However, it go. was in the Renaissance found to be an excellent poison. And they believe uh, that 
well, poison's always a women's tool, right? Is what that old saying is that men like to violently murder people where women tend to murder people slowly with yeah. poison. Um, so they do think that lead was a very common type of poison. So um, they knew then, at least. <laughs> and the French called lead powder poudre de la succession or succession powder because that was the old story that's how you became king was you poison the king before you yeah and so with lead. wow yeah. that's crazy i know i of course this is all just hearsay right yeah, the yeah, french yeah. the french do love a good scandal of course um of course catherine de medici was one of the most famous renaissance queens um her husband was henry the fourth who by the way also dated an older woman her name was diane de poitier uh that has nothing to do with lead but i will tell you this henry the fourth died when a lance went through his eyeball oh my god yeah. what the heck yeah that's intense anyway his wife catherine de medici was famous for poisoning people well that was always the rumor right oh, okay, okay. a lot of people close to her came down with poudre de la succession disease mm, kind of sus kind of sus so there is kind of a lead connection there where it was believed that that might have been one of the things she was using to get get rid of people. They were very brave back then. I know. (laughs) Oh, wow. Of course, in the Renaissance, we start to see the rise of guns, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Guns are fantastic. They found that... uh, Guns are fantastic. Guns are not fantastic. They're not fantastic. They found that lead was fantastic for guns. That's what I meant to say. Yes, yes, yes. Because it was easy to mass produce the mini balls, which are the little bullets they used to use. Um, Pistols, rifles, and cannons um, were great. It was easy to make them out of lead because lead was so cheap and plentiful. Okay. Um, so we move a little forward in time. Actually, not really. Now we're going to just sail to the new world. How about that? Okay. So we land in Virginia at Jamestown. Um, that's when uh, they expect to find gold. Remember that? You saw Pocahontas, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Glory, God, and gold in yeah, the Virginia yeah. company. They don't find gold. They find lead. Of course. Yes. But and re- now they know by now that you can't turn lead into gold. Yeah, that wasn't a real thing. Yeah, either. that wasn't a so real thing. they know that now. Yes. Okay, okay. Well, they figured that out. By 1621, uh, there is a big lead mine in Virginia. Okay. And so now the colonies, they're not sending gold back. They're sending lead back. So they did find a metal that made them money. Yeah. Dis- not, not the one they wanted. Not what but... they thought. So you know the whole reason they thought they were going to find gold was because the Spanish found gold. Oh, okay. But the Spanish didn't find gold in Virginia. They found gold in... Like, Ca- was it California? Or? Well, uh, that uh, happens later. Oh, okay. The Spanish find gold in Mexico oh, and like okay, okay, Hispaniola okay. Okay, so and it all was those like, Caribbean. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But of course, everyone has a very like rudimentary idea of what the world yeah. is. So they're like, well, we'll just sail over there. We'll, we'll go a little bit higher up where the Spanish... Because the Spanish already claimed all those yeah, territories. Yeah. We'll go a little bit higher up. I'm sure there'll be gold there too because it's all the same place, yeah, right? Yeah, just assumed. You yes. Know? Turns out. Yeah, it's actually big, you know. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't quite that. Yeah, yeah, that it would have been. That would have been nice, maybe, but yeah. So lead is responsible for a lot of the technological progression that happens then between us landing in Virginia and the Industrial Revolution. Mm-hmm. I'm so. I mean, not all bad things, right? Yeah, yeah. By the 20th century, the lead emerges as the world's leading producer and consumer of lead. I mean, we're churning out a ton of lead. By 1980, we're turning out about 1.3 million tons of lead a year, which represented 40% of the world's lead supply. It's always us. It's, it's always, always us, us baby. Same, wasn't it the same thing with asbestos? Yes. Well, asbestos was Canada. Oh, yeah. But yeah, it was yeah, still it was North Canada. America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, although there were asbestos mines. The last asbestos mine was in okay, the United okay. States. But Canada was the one that okay. was like making the lead big... Was, lead was us. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. So... Um, let me find this. Here we go. By 1980, it, we're looking at about 5,221 grams of lead per America per year. And the rate of dependence on lead products in by 1980 is 10 times greater than that of the ancient Romans. Wow. So they it was being used like way, way more. Yeah. So Romans were using about 550 grams of lead per person per year. The United States in 1980 was using 5,221 grams per person per year. Okay. That's crazy. Yeah, that is insane. Yeah. Now, um, lead has other uses as well. Um, Did you know lead is fantastic for gasoline? Really? Have you ever pulled up to the gas station? It's like leaded and unleaded. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
That's okay. because it actually, gasoline used to have lead in it. Wow. Yes. Okay. Wow. Yes. I never knew that. So we go to the 1920s now. We're, we're going to hit the decade of the 1920s where they're building the cars. Obviously, mm-hmm. cars come before 1920s, but this is when they're like really starting to yeah. be, build. And they find that um, what they call tetraethyl lead, um, which is a subsidi- subsidiary of, um, it's discovered by GM, General Motors. Okay. And so they make they kind of coin this lead compound, which they find to be really good for these internal combustion engines okay. that were put in cars. So okay. it's General Motors that discovers that lead is a great component to add to gasoline to make the engines run smoother and faster. Um, this really becomes important in World War II, where they're building bigger planes and yeah. bigger trucks and bigger cars. And it goes into the 1970s. Wow. Yeah. Unfortunately... <laughs> Of course, here here comes (laughs) the guy that discovered this in the 20s when they discovered this. One of the guys that discovered this became strangely sick. It's always the guy who discovered it. It's always the guy (laughs) who discovered it. Uh, There were three guys who worked for GM who discovered it. And and the one guy, Thomas Midgley, he was the one who got very, very sick in the winter of 1923. He didn't quite connect it until... 1924 when he started noticing that the workers at his factories were getting sick and dying wow yeah first they were just um uh kind of saying like it's it's a weird illness something's going around right but then 15 people total die oh my god and that's when it starts to get scary because rumors come out that they weren't just dying they were going crazy and then they were dying oh my god and again this is in the 1920s right yeah the journalists were calling it loony gas saying that there were something some sort of gas released into the air in these factories Mm -hmm. from the gasoline so like from the liquid some sort of air gas was being released that was making these men go in crazy um, and so in 1925, the Surgeon General of the United States temporarily suspended the production and sale of lead gasoline and import- appointed a, a group of people basically to figure out what was happening. Finally. Finally. <laughs> but remember I said they used lead gasoline until 1970. Yeah. So clearly this wasn't the end of the lead gasoline oh, yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The committee finished their report in June of 1926. And they said they were rushed, and they said they were so rushed that they were it, they couldn't come to sufficient findings. Basically, oh, wow. that sucks. And because of that, the Surgeon General said, "Okay, well then that means there's nothing wrong with the lead in the gas." You didn't give them enough time. Mm-hmm. That's so sad. The panel Why would even you rush that. I know the panel basically said we couldn't find anything, but we only had seven months. We need more time. Yeah. So the Surgeon General, instead of saying, "Okay, well I'll give you more time," was just like, "Nope, that means that." There's no danger. Yeah, wow. He gave up very quick. Mm-hmm. It's like, clearly there is a danger. 15 people died. Like. And not only did they die, they went crazy. Yeah, they went insane or something. You know, that's insane. But that's of course, crazy. this is 1926. Very soon after comes the Great Depression, mm-hmm. the World War II, and of course, the Cold War. Yeah. So we get distracted by things that are not leaded gasoline. Yeah, yeah. That was the least of our worries at, yes. at that point. But. Yes, yes. So, um, of course, people still, they're still getting sick, right? Still yeah. getting this mysterious disease where they're going crazy and then dying. And so 1985, um, they released uh, the final part of that study from 1926. And in it, so this is, in 85, it's released the study from 1926. That is a long time. In it, there's a warning from the Surgeon General And it says, this is from, again, 1926, but we're reading it in 1985. Okay. And I'm reading it in 2021. Wow. That's like, that's almost 50 years later. I know. So the warning from 1926 from the Surgeon General said, the same guy who dismissed it, by the way, it remains possible that if the use of leaded gasoline becomes widespread, conditions may arise very different from those studied by us, which would render its use more of a hazard than it would appear to be in the case from this investigation. Longer experience may show that even such slight storage of lead as was observed by human guinea pigs in these 1925 studies may eventually lead to recognizable lead poisoning or to chronic degenerative diseases of a less obvious character. 
In view of such possibilities, the committee feels that the investigation begun under their direction must not be allowed to lapse. With the experience obtained and the exact methods now available, it should be possible to follow closely the outcome of a more extended use of this fuel and to determine whether or not it may constitute a menace to the health of the general public after prolonged use or under conditions not now foreseen. The vast increase in the number of automobiles throughout the country makes the study of all such questions a matter of real importance from the standpoint of public health. But they still dismissed it. That's insane. Yeah. They had an idea of what was happening. Yeah, but they they weren't entirely sure about it. Yes. But that's still like, clearly something's happening. Yes. Yes. Wow. So, however, even though they stopped the study... Um, in 1927, that same Surgeon General did say that, like, hey, you kind of need to, like, change your mixture and not put as much lead in it. Mm -hmm. But he also didn't enforce it. Okay. So So he just kind of said it. He kind of said it. So then uh, three decades later, again, um, what would three decades from the 20s be? The 50s? Yeah. There was once again a release that said, like, hey, we need to kind of change the amount of lead we're putting in our gas. Weird things are happening. But again, it was just a recommendation. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Now, we have the Clean Air Act of 1963. And again, they uh, make a recommendation to change the amount of lead in the Mm gasoline because now they're saying, well, we also think it's causing pollution. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Yeah, I mean, gasoline gasoline from cars causes pollution. So with lead, like, yeah, probably worse. In the 1970s, you have the um, the EPA is basically comes into form in the 1970s. Um, so in 1971, the EPA's first administrator declared that they really want to study how lead is a threat to the to the public. So this is the EPA. We've had rumors about lead for years. There's obviously reports in government paperwork that mm-hmm. says like, hey, something's going on yeah. with the lead. Um, so it's in 1971 that the EPA, newly formed, decides to um, really do some research here. Thank God. It took them long enough. <laughs> and this is when they discover that the automobile emissions from the lead gasoline is causing health effects, defects for children and pregnant women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which you're going to talk about. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So in 1973, they confirmed the study and proved that lead from the automobile exhaust was posing a direct threat to the public health. And so the... um, December 1973, they called for a regulation for the gradual reduction of the lead content in the gas. So uh, remember, before it was always a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, now they're saying it has to be done, and they're go- they were implemented in January of 1975 and extended over a five-year period. So that's why we have lead issues into the 80s. Yeah. Um, I mean, it took them so long just to even like regulate it. Yeah. Before it was kind of like, maybe you should do this, you should do this. But how many people are actually going to listen to that, you know? But I want to remind you, too, that this is just leaded gas. We're not talking about yeah, pipes or paint. We haven't even talked about paint or pipes. Like, this is just the gas they put in the cars. Yeah, this is just gas that they put in the cars. So um, they actually finished the lead phase out in gasoline in 1988. That's when they stopped? That's when they finally phased all the lead out of our gasoline. So they just took it out completely. Yes. Lead paint goes out of use in 78, 1978. That is so long. Yes. And lead pipes, now they had been out of use for a while, but remember, you can't just go around replacing all the water pipes all over the United States. That is cost prohibitive. Yeah. So even though they kind of said like, hey, we're going to stop using lead pipes, they still exist. Yeah. Because just like here in Houston, what we're doing with our cast iron, we have cast iron here, pipes in Mm -hmm. Houston, by the way, we're slowly replacing them block by block. I mean, it's not like they could go to everybody's house and be like, we're we're getting rid of lead pipes. We got to change them. Like, that's not cheap. Yeah, it's not. It's just cost prohibitive. And you'd have to rip up someone's house. Yeah. So again, even though lead pipes were kind of phased out as well, they're still a huge issue because yeah. there's a lot of old houses that have them. Yeah, and not everybody has like the money to change pipes. That's really expensive. 
And it's same with the lead paint. So although the lead paint was discontinued in 1978, um, you still find it in a lot of houses because those houses were painted before 1978. Yeah, yeah. And they weren't going to tell people to strip their walls. Yeah, yeah. You have to completely just get rid of your walls to... You'd have to strip all okay, the paint okay. off the wall, oh, okay, which okay, probably okay. something that's from earlier than 1978, it would just be better to take the drywall off and... R redo it. Redo or it. But I'm going to talk about... Um, a, it's called lead paint abatement. Okay. Uh, in my last section. Okay. So cool, let's cool. not get too ahead of ourselves yeah, yeah, yet. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm going to hand it to you, though. All right, cool. So and now we're going to talk a little bit about what is lead, you know, what is lead, and how it affects the human body, which is honestly uh, terrifying. <laughs> it's very terrifying. So lead is a naturally occurring element found in small amounts in the Earth's crust. And while it does have some beneficial uses, like, as, you know, we thought, as, yeah. as we talked about. It does not turn into gold, though. Yeah. <laughs> it can be toxic to humans and animals, causing health effects. So where is lead found? Lead is found in all parts of our environment, in the air, the soil, the water, and even inside our homes, like in pipes and paint. And much of our exposure comes from human activities, including the use of fossil fuels, um, including which we just talked about the, the leaded gasoline, some types of uh, industrial facilities and past use of lead based paint in homes. Lead and lead compounds have been used in a wide variety of products found in and around our homes like paint, ceramics, pipes and plumbing materials, gas batteries. Oh, I actually have someone to add uh, playground equipment. Oh, oh, because there's like, you know, they, they got the bars and stuff. Yeah. Like that. And even the old um, wooden playgrounds, like really old school, like when I was in kindergarten, we had wood playgrounds. They had to tear them all down because they were treated with lead okay. and other like volatile compounds, yeah. but also toys lead like oh. there were all those old children like metal toys That's so scary they you were know, kids are just chewing just on it mouth. yeah <laughs> but also you, that's actually still a problem with some toys from china there was a big oh. scandal a couple years ago that china was using lead paint on their toys that's horrible um but in the united states it was like those old creepy toys like creepy mm. victorian children's toys and even i feel like toys from the 50s and 60s are kind of creepy too yeah <laughs> but they they had a lot of lead so like you yeah. said it was really used in everything yeah it could even funny. be used in like your mugs or like your yeah, silverware ceramics um apparently batteries yeah ammunition which we talked about that too and cosmetics which oh yeah uh cosmetics was a big one i didn't mention that in the renaissance but a lot of women would powder their face <gasps> white they put it in makeup yeah oh my god that's terrifying i forgot to mention that but yes <laughs> that's actually terrifying uh, oh my god all right so who is at risk children of course Children are very much at risk. Lead is particularly dangerous to children because their growing bodies absorb more lead than adults do. So that's insane. Mm -hmm. um, and their brains and nervous systems are more sensitive to the damaging effects of lead. Babies and young children can also be more highly exposed to lead because they often put their hands and other objects that can have lead from dust or soil into their mouths. We Idiots. Know this. Yep. I mean, they're babies. You know, they don't know any better. <laughs> um, <laughs> children may also be exposed to lead by eating and drinking food or water containing lead um, or from dishes or glasses that contain lead. Inhaling lead dust from lead-based paint. So even just the dust or lead contaminated soil or from playing uh, with toys with lead-based paint. Adults may be um, sorry. Adults may be exposed to lead by eating and drinking food or water containing lead, or dishes or glasses that contain lead. They may also breathe lead dust by spending time in areas where lead-based paint is deteriorating, and during renovation or repair work that um, disturbs painted surfaces. So I'm sure, like, if they are replacing lead paint or something, they'd have to be careful. They do. There are certain requirements that have to be met during lead abatement Ooh, okay okay, yes, okay. yeah yes. we'll talk about, about that more later um and during okay yeah during renovation or repair work that disturbs the painted surfaces working in a job or engaging in hobbies where lead is used such as making stained glass mm -hmm. um, can increase exposure as can certain uh folk remedies containing lead and then a pregnant woman's exposure to lead from these sources is of particular concern because it, it can result in exposure to her developing baby yep yes so health problems caused by lead. It doesn't matter if um, a person breathes in, swallows, or absorbs lead particles. The health effects will be the same no matter like what way you get it. 
But um, the body absorbs higher levels of lead when it's breathed in. So if you're breathing it in, it'll actually absorb more. That's interesting. Yeah, as if you, uh, like, compared to, like, if you swallowed it or something like that. You know, I actually think I knew that. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you breathe it in, I guess it's it's faster, but they all end up with the same health effects. So I think, um, you, yeah, you get sick faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, it'll be the same. So sickness. that's why the Romans took so long to go to have problems because they were drinking it. Yeah, they were drinking Whereas it. Whereas the factory workers were going crazy mm -hmm, they because were they were inhaling, inhaling it. it. Yep, yep. So within our bodies, lead is absorbed and stored in our bones, blood, and tissues. It does not stay there permanently. Rather, it is stored there as a source of continual internal exposure. So once it's in there, you're just constantly being exposed to the lead. And so as we age, our bones demineralize and the internal exposures may increase as a result of larger releases of lead from the bone tissue. There is concern that lead may mobilize from the bone among women undergoing menopause, which is interesting. Well, because your bone density decreases. Yeah, so postmenopausal women have been found to have higher blood lead levels than women who haven't gone through menopause yet. That's Yeah, that makes sense because your bones are disintegrating. Yeah, essentially. yeah. So health effects from short-term exposure to lead. Lead poisoning can happen if a person is exposed to very high levels of lead over a short period of time. And when this happens, get ready, there's a lot. <laughs> a person may feel abdominal pain, constipation, you'll be tired, you could have headaches, you'll be irritable, loss of appetite, memory loss, yep. pain or tingling in the hands or feet, and you'll feel weak. So I'm sure that's like why they call it they like being depressed and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so because these symptoms may occur slowly or may be caused by other things, lead poisoning can easily be overlooked. Exposure to high levels of lead may cause anemia, weakness, and kidney and brain damage. Very high lead exposure, as we know, can cause death. Yeah, I'm sure it is hard to pinpoint because I feel like with a lot of things, like there are so many symptoms that like just intermix with one another so it's it can be hard to diagnose but we've talked about this before too yeah it's almost like to me sounds like an autoimmune disease or something yeah yeah um but also back then they were like not into autoimmune diseases yeah so it could have just been like you know like the romans just gave it a name mm -hmm. you know that yeah, people yeah. would just give it a name so Lead can cross the placental barrier, which means pregnant women who are exposed to lead also expose their unborn child. Lead can damage a developing baby's nervous system. Even low-level lead exposures in developing babies have been found to affect behavior and intelligence. Lead exposure can cause miscarriage, stillbirths, and infertility in both men and women, which we talked about, like Julius Caesar and mm -hmm. his nephew. Um, generally lead affects children more than it does adults. Children tend to show signs of severe lead toxicity at lower levels than adults. Lead poisoning has occurred in children whose parents accidentally brought home lead dust on their clothes. Yeah. And in fact, I forgot about this, but in the state of California, they have that, like, have you ever got something from TJ Maxx? It's like in the state of California, this thing may cause cancer. Oh, I think so. Like they have things where they need to mark like how much lead is in wow. stuff. Wow. That's good though. Yeah. So, you know, they're making us aware instead of just like, here you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it does still exist in toys, but I think a lot of that is because we get toys manufactured from China and other yeah, Asian countries yeah, that's true. where they don't have the... The, regu the, the same regula regulation. Regulation, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, you're good. You're good. Um, neurological effects and intellectual disability have also occurred in children whose parents may have job related lead exposure. Hmm. Yeah. So it actually, wow. Yeah. It affects the brain. Like I said, your intelligence for, for children. So. So I actually have something to add on that. Yes, when yes. you have, if you have, kids they will do a blood test for lead exposure when they're little oh nice. yeah like no i think it's no matter what like i think it's just one of the things that's like done in the well child yeah. check is they test for lead levels because they want to try to like bite it before it becomes yeah, too serious that's good though because you know like it's not just lead that can affect children you know they're they're definitely more easily exposed to a lot of things than we are so i'm glad that they do that <laughs> um and then the other thing is 
we are all exposed to lead all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is in the air yeah, and it's, it's in, in the, the soil. soil. It's yep. in like the food we eat. So if you get a blood test, they are going to find lead in your blood no matter yeah, what. Yeah, yeah. But I guess the only... There's like safe levels. Yeah. Let me look like for... you shouldn't be concerned unless it's like a high level. Safe level of lead. Oh, there's no known safe blood level for lead. Oh. Yeah. What? Okay, they want five micrograms to something of blood lead for children under 12. I don't really understand the science. Yeah, yeah. But so there is like a level. Okay, that is uh, like not to be concerned. Yeah, yeah. Not to be as concerned. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Man. Scary. All right. Lastly, health effects from long-term exposure to lead. So a person who is exposed to lead over time, I feel it's pretty much the same abdominal pain constipation depressed distracted forgetful irritable or and then you know nauseous or sick people with a uh, prolonged exposure to lead may also be at risk for high blood pressure heart disease kidney disease and reduced fertility so yeah so it e- even if you're not a child or a pregnant woman you can still get sick from lead yeah yeah so you know children they're more susceptible I think that's the right word. More susceptible to having like those effects and getting sick. Pregnant women too, but also, you know, regular adults as well. So anybody. So no one is safe. Yeah, no one is safe. No one is safe. It's not just pregnant women and kids. It's everybody. They have the highest risk. Yeah, they just have a higher risk. Especially, you know, pregnant women, they're holding a baby in there. And, you know, kids are small. Like we said, they're still developing. So things will affect them differently. But adults too. Adults too. So I looked up the exact year when lead pipes were discontinued. It was 1986. Wow. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, that's a long time ago, but not. Not that really. Long, that not was, really. I mean, that's 34 years ago. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it hasn't um, even been 100 years since then. Yeah. So, so, yeah, there's definitely a lot of lead pipes probably sticking around somewhere. Yes, there are. On um, Anything else? Nope, that's it. So we can move on to the, the home. The home. My turn? Yes. yes. All righty. So I said uh, 1986 for lead pipes, 1978 for lead paint. Okay, so lead paint was first. Lead paint was first. But I want you to remember that just because, as we said, that they've been phased out doesn't mean they don't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. In fact, they really do exist a lot. Yeah, because it's not, it's not like everybody was like, okay, let me get rid of it, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. The houses um, that I've looked at in, in Memorial are all from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Oh, okay. And when you look at those houses and you put offers in for them to buy them, you get what's called a lead paint addendum. And it yep. warns you that the house might have one coat of lead paint. Okay. Now, here's something interesting. In the state of Texas, even if the house was flipped, which means they took it down to the studs and then re-put it back together mm-hmm. and everything, which means that they would have gotten rid of the lead paint, right? Yeah. Well, you still have to sign the lead paint addendum because of the age of the home. Okay. Yeah. So it's just to make people aware. Yeah. Um, so I'm not really going to talk too much about the lead pipes in the home because I don't know much about it other than that you need to have your plumbing replaced if you okay. have lead pipes. Yeah. A lot of times it's not people's homes that are poisoning them. It's the city sewer system or the city, excuse me, the city water system that's poisoning them. Okay. That's the issue in Flint. Oh, okay, so yeah. it's the city the, pipes. The city that city are, pipes okay. that are poisoning them. Uh, if that's the case, I would recommend... Um, let me see if there's actually a filter that works for, cause I just don't know about enough about lead pipes. Yeah. Water filter that works for lead. So there are lead filters you can buy. Okay. Nice. Um, but in the case of Flint, a lot of them just drink bottled water. Yeah. I feel like that's the safest thing to do. Cause yeah, I mean, a filter is nice, but even then like. Things break. Things, you know, things you don't, don't do their job. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if I would like trust that. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about on when it comes to lead in the home, I'm going to focus on lead paint just okay. because I know more about the topic. Yeah. I don't want to give you wrong information here. Um, the issue with lead paint is it flakes off. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you too. Is there a way to know if it's lead paint? Like, yes. Okay. okay and I'll cool. get to that. Cool. Lead paint. Oh, lead paint <laughs> lead paint tends to flake off at um what we would call vulnerable areas which is usually the window frames the door frames and staircases okay. because they have the most use right yeah um 
not just like oh uh, like behind us is a long wall mm-hmm. i wouldn't worry too much about that wall flaking off lead paint although this won't wall won't because it's from 2017 yeah, yeah. but um I'd be more worried about the door flaking off paint just because I'm opening and shutting the yeah, door. So. Same with the window. Same with the staircase. You're going okay. up and down the staircase. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And it flakes off. It can actually flake off in chunks, like lead paint chips. Ooh, or okay. it um, most commonly flakes off in dust. And okay. you just talked about the, the, the dust, dust is the most harmful thing. So where it comes down to children is they're either inhaling the dust or they're eating. Because, you know, little kids, like babies and toddlers, eat stuff off the floor. Yeah, they, ha- they even have those little toys. That yeah, just for, like, exactly. Chewing, and, you know, it's not always clean. So they're eating the paint dust that's on the floor, the paint chips that have flaked off onto the floor. Mm-hmm. The best remediation short of abatement, and abatement means getting rid of lead completely, the lead paint completely. The best remediation short of abatement is um, wipe down any dust. So whenever you see dust in the home, you should um, assume that there's lead in the dust. Okay. Also vacuum for the same reason and mop hardwood or tile. But if it's really bothering you, so you... And every state is different, but I'm pretty sure most states have this lead-based paint addendum that warn you when you move into a house before 1978 that yeah. it probably has lead paint. If it's really, really bothering you, you can get – I said abatement. I meant addendum. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I'm too many a, yeah, fancy yeah, A yeah. words. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Let me start all over again. Most states have lead paint addendums yeah. that warn you about moving into a house before 1978. Um, and I want to say this. If you paint over the walls with a good quality house paint, you can actually paint in the lead paint. Oh. Where it won't flake or chip. It'll just be kind of just stuck it's in there. Underneath. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And in most cases, you can assume a house built in 1978 may have been painted a few times. Yeah. Unless you're dealing with the original owners. But even then, they might have repainted the house a yeah. few times. So the good news is if you have lead paint, you don't want to do all that cleaning I just described. You can also just paint it in. Okay. But that still doesn't 100% eliminate the risk. Yeah. Um, And the other question before I talk about lead abatement, I want to ask, do home inspectors look for lead? I don't think so. No. Okay. No. The home inspector is not going to be able to tell just by looking at the wall that it has lead paint. Okay. You as the buyer would have already been informed because you signed that lead addendum when you yeah. put the it's offer in on the house. that they're supposed to tell you. Yes. Okay. They've already told you the house probably has lead paint. So it's not the responsibility of the home inspector to tell you. Yeah. Now that's just the state of Texas, but I'm pretty sure I would be willing to bet good money. Most states are the same. The same. Okay. So who do you hire? In Texas, you could hire uh, someone who's actually called a lead inspector. Ooh, and there's, nice. yeah, there's two types of lead inspectors. There is the certified lead inspector, and then there's the certified lead risk assessor. And they both fall under the Texas Department of Health and Human Services, nice. which in Texas is called Texas Department of State Health Services. It doesn't flow. Yeah. It doesn't flow quite as Sounds well. Sounds kind of weird. But- yeah. Yeah. So the lead inspector, they can look for lead because you just asked, like, how are they looking for lead? They can either collect paint samples, which they'll send into an EPA lab, or they can do what's called an XRF test. And an XRF stands for X-ray fluorescence. And it looks kind of like um a label maker yeah it, does look, <laughs> it looks like one of those things like like a walmart employee yes you know? oh my god like a price checker yeah, like or even like check. a label maker for yeah, a price thing yeah. yeah you're right it does uh anyway it can see through the outer surface to determine if lead paints underneath isn't that cool that's pretty cool that's a cool little tool that is a nice little tool so the lead inspector can either take samples of paint chips or um they can use the xrf what Sounds they can't fancy. do in um the state of texas is do what's called a chemical test i guess some states allow chemical test of paints you are not allowed to do that in the state of texas the inspector produces a report you know detailing his finds and again if he finds any samples he has to send them out to a epa lab okay now the lead risk assessor can do everything the lead inspector does but they can also collect dust and soil samples 
determine the existence, nature, severity, and location of the lead-based paint. Nice. And they can also create a risk assessment. That's why they're called a lead risk assessor. Yeah. So they can do a little bit more. Just than the a little guy. bit more, yeah. The lead inspector is going to tell you whether or not you have lead. The lead risk assessor can tell you all the exact places where you have lead and then what the risk is. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I, I would do the risk assessor in my opinion. <laughs> so then we get to lead abatement. Remember, lead abatement just means getting rid of yeah, the lead. Yeah, getting rid of the lead. Uh, you don't want to clean and you don't want to paint. You're still paranoid. You want it all gone. Mm -hmm. So that's where you move to abatement, which means complete removal of anything that has lead. Yeah. And because the dust is so dangerous, anybody who's doing lead abatement has to be protected um, by the state of Texas work requirements and OSHA because they don't want to inhale the lead dust, right? Yeah. Um, so on that note, that means you have to hire a professional. If you're going to tear down your lead walls, I mean, if you don't tell anybody, I guess you could do it yourself. But if you want your lead walls professionally torn yeah, down. Yeah, that's probably not the best idea. That actually sounds really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> if you want a professional to tear down your lead walls, it has to be done by a certified lead abatement supervisor or a lead abatement project designer. And whatever company they work for has to be a certified lead firm. And that's all in the state of Texas. Like I said, every state yeah, is different. Yeah. But Texas is licensing everyone when it comes to lead, which is funny when you remember that roofs and stucco and foundations are not licensed. That's so true. That's crazy. And I yet, mean, yeah. It's weird what they've chosen to be picky about. Yeah, it is weird. Because I feel like you should be licensed for all those things. Like yeah, that. I feel like if you're doing anything to someone's home, you should hold a license. Yeah. Because people live in that house. Yeah, people are going to live there maybe for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So... so uh, whatever. But in lead has a lot of rules, mostly and most likely, I should say, because there are so many health and safety hazards associated yeah, with it. I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. Also, if you're getting a professional lead abatement done on your house, they have to give the lead workers have to give that information to the Texas um, State Health Service. OK, so there's a record that your house has been fully cleansed of the lead. It's like an exorcism, <laughs> basically. Um, but I want to point out that not many people do this. You are not required to do it. Yeah. This is optional. This isn't like mold when you find mold and yeah. it has to be taken care of. Yeah. Lead, the lead abatement, the lead inspection, all of that is optional. That's good. I feel like I would do it if like, I don't know. You don't know. Honestly, like I lived in a lot of lead situations. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, like I lived in DC for six years. Every apartment I lived in had lead paint yeah. and lead pipes, you know? And, um, I just, I, my best understanding of lead is if you do repaint it properly, it does seal it in. Okay. You're not going to get the dust. It gets stuck behind like that new coat of paint. The new coat of paint. Yeah. Um, but let me Google that. I mean, I could just be talking out of my butt, right? Yeah. I got to keep this peachy. Okay. Can lead paint be sealed? All right. Let's find out. They say, use, uh, Google says, use an encapsulant. An encapsulant is the best and safest way to cover lead paint. So let's see what that means. How do you paint over lead safely? This is according to uh, a lead company. Um, not in Texas. This is a yeah. different lead company. Um, and let's find out. It says test your existing paint. Mm -hmm. So do test your existing paint. Don't chip, scrape, or sand your lead paint. Because remember, we don't want dust to come out. Yeah. Um, you should, if you are um, working with the original wall, the children should not be in the house. So if you're moving into a lead house and you want to paint that wall, you should do that before you have children move in. Yeah. Or pregnant women. Um, also you should, if you're dealing with the original paint, you should wear a respirator until yeah. you've covered it. That's what it says. Um, and wear gloves and keep your clothes like on, like change before you get in your car and yeah. change before you go into your house. Burn the clothes. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, okay. This is where it comes to what paint to use. Oh, you want to use, it's what's called an encapsulant. Like I said, they're thicker than regular paint primers and work to seal or encapsulate the lead behind a membrane. There's three types of encapsulants, traditional polymers, epoxy or polyurethane polymers. And there's cement like substances that also contain polymers. Wow. You can find encapsulant primers at your local hardware or paint store. Just make sure you follow the guidelines when it comes to testing preparation and application. 
Keep in mind that encapsulants are not guaranteed if they're applied to the following. Floors or other walked on areas, areas that rub together like doors and windows. Mm-hmm. You can still get that chips coming off or badly deteriorated areas. So um, it's still not perfect as it yeah. turns out. I eat my own words. <laughs> So, I mean, nobody's perfect. Nothing is perfect. That's so. true. But then there comes to the question, and this happens um, a lot. And uh, first of all, I want to thank my Aunt Amy for giving me such a nice compliment. My Aunt Amy just oh, complimented yeah. us. Yeah. I was going to tell you that. I was going to tell you that. I was like, somebody said you look nice today. <laughs> that's my Aunt Amy. Um, we love that. She, she is also one of our biggest fans, So I along with your mom and my mom. Yeah. <laughs> So, no, you leave, we have three fans. Yep, yep. Our, our moms and Aunt Amy. <laughs> and Aunt Amy. So, thank you, Aunt Amy. Um, where was I going with this? Oh, so I want to I want to remind everyone that there is again another kind of loophole for the lead paint. If the house has been completely redone, and in Houston that happens a lot because we flood. Yeah. And when the flooding yeah. happens, you have to tear out the drywall. And when you tear out the drywall, you put new drywall and new paint on it. But they're still going to make you sign that lead paint addendum because the house is older than 1978. Okay, so even if you've, like, done these things, you still have to make it known. Yes. So I said this before, but I just want to say it again, just so everyone's clear, because it does get a little confusing. Because mm-hmm. I know the next question we're going to ask is... Um, well, this house has been taken out of the studs and completely remodeled. Is it still have lead paint issues? Yeah. Really, no, right? Yeah, no. But because of the age, they're never going to say 100% no. Yeah. You just you just don't know? Yeah, you yeah said I'm no sure a lot. you're also just like not 100% sure. Like if it's completely gone, I mean, there could be dust. There could there be dust. Like, I really, like I just, I feel like, and when it comes to the lead paint addendum for homes that have been remodeled completely, it's just a better safe than sorry type situation. Yeah, and it's just, I guess, just to make the homeowner aware. Yeah, that the house is old enough to have had lead paint at yeah. some point. Yeah, Because even if they replace the drywall, they might have not got new windows. You know, they might have not replaced the stairwell, depending on yeah. how high the and water we know, went. You know, like we said, not nobody's perfect. Yeah. Even builders, so we yeah. don't know what went down, how it went down, or what happened. So, And if it's a two-story home and it flooded and they just replaced the first floor, they might have not replaced the second yeah, floor. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, there. I mean, that's why it still exists in any home. You still have to sign that lead addendum, any home before 1978. Yeah, there's a lot of ifs and buts and, you know. Loopholes, like yeah. gray areas, fuzzy, mm-hmm. stuff like that. So, um, lead paint is disturbing. It is. I think of all the stuff we've talked about, lead paint has like the worst side effects. So, so far. Yeah. Yeah. Lead paint sounds pretty bad. A lot of them sound pretty bad. I feel like the one that's probably like the least bad was pesticides because I feel like that one's a little more difficult to encounter. But I feel like the least bad was asbestos. You think so? Yes. Because you, if you live in a house with asbestos, it's probably not going to hurt you. Yeah, that's true. But if you live in a house with lead paint, it probably is going to hurt you yeah yeah lead paint's definitely one of the scary ones like carbon monoxide yes and, yeah. yes but we're not done yet we still have five more oh by the way we're halfway oh yeah we still have five more episodes yeah. to go five to terrify more, five more topics five more scary topics i like this season this is like probably my favorite season so far i know i feel like we're making some real like yeah we're really, interesting finds we're really learning things yeah. really learning things especially me i didn't know about any of this <laughs> now you're gonna go live in a tent because yep. it seems like the safest place now like the when the day comes i have kids i'm gonna be like all right put on this hazmat suit let's go out <laughs> we're gonna buy one of those um rebel vans that like vans that you like live in yeah they're, i think range rover or like mercedes makes them they're like hundred thousand oh dollars but they're God. solar power oh. and it has a little kitchen has a bed area in it we've saw it when we went camping like out in wow, the wilderness. That somebody had really it really nice yeah i know i know i was super jealous <laughs> anyway digression is it time for credits yep time for credits All right, so our intro was What Does Lead Poisoning Do to Your Brain by PBS Digital Studios. By the way, watch that whole thing, but don't watch it before bed because you're not going to sleep. Yeah, the the video is called uh, What Does Lead Poisoning Do to Your Brain? Yes. So, (laughs) Uh, yeah, it is literally called, you know, scary things. Okay. The music credit is Kevin McLeod of Incomtech. Our source credit is the EPA and a site called Corrosion Doctors. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Check us out on YouTube at A Action Home Inspection Group Houston, on Facebook, on Instagram at Home Inspector underscore Texas, and on TikTok at Houston Home Inspector. Now, remember I said lead is the scariest thing we've talked about so far. Yeah, you did say so far. I did say so far. Yes. Because next week, we're talking about arsenic. 
Arsenic. Okay. Uh, next week. Next podcast. Next it's not podcast. next week. It's yeah. not next week. Next episode. Next episode. Next episode, we're cool. talking about I don't know arsenic. anything about arsenic, so this should be good. <laughs> I know. We talked about people poisoning people with lead. People definitely poison people with arsenic. All right. Wow. People were really ballsy back then. <laughs> people still poison people with That's arsenic. That's true. That's true, but maybe also, not as much. <laughs> Mm. Uh, that we know about <laughs> that we know spoiler alert though your water well is also poisoning you with arsenic i don't have one so <laughs> yes <laughs> and crazy. we will get to that next time but meanwhile i'm mary and i'm Isis. and we're the homegirls and we will chat with you about arsenic yes next i'm excited time. yeah I'm excited. the skull and crossbones yeah, scared but excited <laughs> yes i would be a good halloween episode but oh, it's yeah. gonna be halloween oh. in may episode yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right we'll talk to you then yes F- facebook live stay alive yay all right thank you for everyone for watching us on facebook live we will be back in i think it's two weeks maybe three weeks yeah two or three weeks to talk about arsenic so we'll catch you on the next one